why does Microsoft hate you? <laughs> <laughs> that was an easier learning path for me than it has to be an easier learning path for other people out there. I literally hate the time intelligent functions. For all the videos that I have seen for uh, Dax for Humans, I've seen you wearing this robe. In today's In Conversation series, I'm connecting with Greg Deckler. If you don't know who Greg is, Greg has been the longest standing contributor in the Power BI community and his solutions have helped thousands of people in their DAX data modeling and Power BI problem. I have also personally learned a lot from the solutions that he posts on the Power BI community. And in this interesting conversation that I have with Greg, we talk about a variety of topics on data, Power BI, and we also talk about slightly controversial measure totals. When you create a matrix or a table visual in Power BI, and you're running a complex measure in that, there could be a possibility that the individual rows do not really add up to the total. Now, Greg has been profusely promoting the idea for Microsoft to fix measure totals through various memes, daily posts that he makes on LinkedIn and Twitter threads and whatnot. Let's just try to get him some votes on that incredible idea. I'm going to post a link to the idea in the description of the video and you should definitely give your vote for that. Now, no further ado, let's go meet Greg Deckler. Even before I start asking you to introduce yourself, why does Microsoft hate you? <laughs> 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 story of that comes from a, so I had an idea for a blog article and it was about, uh, so I, I've contributed like, like over 200 quick measures to the gallery and, you know, and some of the quick measures that have been in the gallery, they've incorporated into the product. I think uh, Chris Webb has his, like his star rating is in there that actually started as a quick measure submission. Sure. Um, so I submitted all these, you know, all these quick measures to the gallery. They've never put one of those into the product. And so I wanted to write a blog article and I went, you know, a, basically from the perspective of somebody that's, you know, upset over this, you know, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're and so they go out and they, they write their own tool to do quick measures within Power BI, an, an external tool. And so I had, the, and I had, I had this blog article all in my head and written, and it's, it's called Microsoft Hates Greg's Quick Measures. I think I posted that on LinkedIn um, and that sort of thing. And it's, it's just a crazy blog article, but I think it's pretty funny. Um, but then I realized it's like, oh, I need to actually write this external tool for this to be, you know, to be able to follow through with this joke. So that's how Microsoft hates Greg's quick measures that mush um, that tool became about was because I wanted to write a blog article of all things. Um, so anyway, that's the story behind it. And then, and then it turned into a YouTube channel so I could explain how to use the tool. And then I wrote some additional external tools like conductor and um, met metadata mechanic and things like that. So that's kind of the, sorry, that was a long story. Long explanation, but that's where that comes from. Greg, when you were just about to join the meeting and your camera was on, uh, you stepped aside from your chair just a little bit. There was a picture that I saw at the back, which was like a diagram, like a CIA type diagram that I see typically see in movies. You know, you have your picture pinned down there and, you know, have these maps. I don't know. What, what was that exactly? So, so that's the, that is my, um, my, my son, when he, uh, when I wrote that Microsoft hates Greg blog article, my son came up with a, a <laughs> picture of like a conspiracy board of why Microsoft hates Greg. Right. And so, oh. and so he, and that was on, that was what the, uh, the image on the header for the article was. And so then what I, what, what we did was we, uh, we just created it in real life. <laughs> and so, and that's my, now I don't have, I used to have that image as like my virtual background. And uh, so we just create it in real life. And so now, you know, when I do Microsoft hates Greg or record those videos and I, you know, I have my, my background, but it's, it's not a image. <laughs> Coming back to the question now, how did it all start for you for Power BI? And, you know, you've grown to like, right, I believe five or six books on Power BI. So tell us about your journey. How did you start with Power BI and, you know, what got you to here? Well, I mean, I think like everybody else, right? I, you know, as part of my job, I did a lot with Excel and, you know, you have, you had the classic problem, right? In Excel of, oh, okay, I get a report from finance. I take that information I suck it into Excel. I do a bunch of data transformations on it. I get the report the way I want it to look, do my calculations. And I, you know, and I was doing that in like every week or every month, right? And it's a real pain. Um, so when Microsoft started releasing the Power BI tool, you know, the power tools for Excel and that back then, I really started getting into it. And because it solved, you know, problems for me um, and I really like the tools. And so I've just been, I've been with it ever since pretty, I'd say early on. Um, I've been working with the tools pretty much as long as they've been out there uh, because they solved problems for me. And, 
and I, and then after that, I just I've just continued on with Power BI. You know, as it's changed and grown. You know, I was there when it was Power BI Publisher, and we had to publish stuff to, to basically SharePoint, and it was terrible experience in a lot of ways. Um, then they came out with Desktop, and they they came out with the Power BI Community Forum, and I'm I was like I'm I'm like in the 300s on that. So I was one of the first 300 people basically to sign up for the Power BI forums when they first were launched on community.powerbi.com. You know, and I started answering people's questions that were out there. And and there for a while, I think I was, you know, I had like the most solutions and everything like that. And that's how my, the Pact, my publisher, they contacted me like, hey, we noticed you answer a lot, a lot of forum posts. You know, would you like to write a book on Power BI? So I'm like, you know, it's, I've always had a natural ability to write. My mom actually wanted me to become an author. I told her there was no money in it, um, which turned out to be pretty true. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, you know, I like writing, and so I sure I'll write a book. Then it led to the next book. So the first book was Learn Power BI. Then I got to write the book. My favorite book that I that I've written actually was Dax Cookbook, um, which is mm-hmm. the least sell best selling. So you know, not everybody has agreed with me on that. It's the I really liked I really liked writing that book. And then let's see, then there was like another second edition of Power BI or Learn Power BI. And then I wrote the second editions of Brett Powell's books, um, which is Power BI Cookbook and Mastering Power BI. And got to work with Brett on those. The uh, other thing that uh, I noticed, so I started on the community back in 2016, 2017, taking a look at the questions. And mine were just generally trying to understand how people answer questions and, you know, how people formulate these answers and come up with the DAX code. I took a look at uh, quite a few responses that you provided in the community. And one of the responses that intrigued me to take a look at your profile was that how to ask questions on Power BI community or how to get your questions answered on Power BI community. How did you come up with that? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a fairly, I mean, I think any forum that basically exists for a while, it ends up having one of those things. Um, and since I was on the forums very early on, and there, that something like that wasn't there, and it's a it's still a big problem on the community forums. You know, we get questions. And they, right. You know, they don't provide any. You know, it's like I'm trying to do this do this calculation, and they don't give you any sample data. They don't tell you how they're using you know this measure in, in a visual or what things are in the visual. I mean, and it's like it's frustrating because it's like you know you go back and forth with people like, oh, I need the data, I need this. You know, how are you doing? They're like, it's not working. It's not working. It's like. Okay, you know, it's like, okay, you know, and my big thing that I like to do is I like to, okay, give me your data, I'll get your data, I'll mock up a PBX file, and I'll write the measure, and then I'll, I'll send you back the PBX file, and if it's not working for you for whatever reason, okay, here's a working example, and then you can hopefully figure out what's going wrong. Um, but there's just so many variables with Power BI, desktop, because That's of all right. things like context and everything else that you get into, it's just, you know, it's... I don't know. But if you follow a few rules, you know, like around like what I put in that uh, article, you usually get back an answer pretty quickly from not, you know, not necessarily me, but somebody with, you know, there's a lot of good, good Power BI people on on those community forums that, you know, MK and Tamar J, Tamar June. And there's a ton of people out there that are great. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I figured that uh, that post was helping the other uh, members answer questions better. Also, of course, you know, uh, the people who are new and naive to the platform the first time and they're asking questions, it certainly helps them to ask the questions, but they were also helping other people not get into this to and fro conversations of, hey, what's your data? What's your question? And things like that. So that was incredible once I took a look at those those series of posts. So I could almost tell that if somebody is question is half cooked or half baked and not really complete in, you know, in terms of explanation, you would just jump in and just putting down that post and, you know, how to ask a yeah, so that was interesting. Unfortunately, was it's probably one of my most, I have macros for a lot of things. So like measure totals, right? I, got, I have a macro that just, you know, okay, here it is. It points you to the blog article, go read this. <laughs> now you know how it works, you know? And, and now and I, and I've, got, I've got like 12 of these macros for just very common problems that come up, like measure aggregation. Like, hey, I, I wrote this measure, but now I need to get the largest amount that this measure returns and things like that. So yeah, I've got macros for all of those things. And probably, unfortunately, the two I use the most is probably that, hey, pr- please provide more information. And the other one is the measure total one. <laughs> so those are probably my two. I use those macros the most. Where are these macros written? In Excel? Uh, no, they're in action in the community. So in the community of uh, oh. PowerBI.com, they're actually, you can go into your profile and you can set up macros um, for, for oh, answering. Okay. So, it, and 
you know, if you want, I can send you my macros and, and you can go Please. add them to your profile. Please. I, I <laughs> at least would like to take a look at it. It has, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I at least, I go there once in a while, but it's not anymore to answer questions. It's just to take a look at the, the problems that are just cropping up, especially in Power Query. Um, but yeah, uh, DAX once in a while. But it will be interesting to take a look at the macros that you've put together. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I'm really big in the, in building and helping the community around that sort of thing. Like, I mean, I always, I don't know if it's my background as a consultant or what it is, but I, as you know, when you're building a consulting practice, right? I mean, one of the biggest things you you can do to help your consulting practice practice succeed is is getting the, your knowledge down into, you know, and reusable. You know, if, if you can reuse Absolutely. something, right? And so I, I've always taken that, that approach with the community. It's like, okay, that's why I post out to the quick measure gallery so much. It's like, okay, I solved this problem. Other people are going to have this problem. Instead of me answering the same question, you know, 20 times, I'll just put it out there in the in the community and then I'll just reference it. And, mm -hmm. you know, the same thing with, uh, hey, here's, I think there's the uh, how to get your answer, question answered quickly. And I think I have another one that like is the common problems with Power BI, right? You know, here's, a, here's a, you know, here there's another article that just lists all this, you know, here's the most common problems that I see on the forums. So, and it's probably because I'm on the forums so much. I probably have a different perspective on that than a lot of people close to it. Yeah. So there have been various points of touch points of uh, me taking a look at your journey with Power BI. And the first one was, of course, the community. And I took a look at a lot of your answers and learned a lot of stuff from there. And the second one was when you started talking about, hey, I don't need Calculate. Could you maybe? <laughs> <laughs> and okay, I'd maybe tell you my perspective a bit later, but could you maybe talk about that and expand on that, that when did you come to this realization that calculate isn't that important as people suggested to be? And you can really solve some very complex problems without calculate as well. So it actually came out of part of it is because I was answering questions on the forums and it was frustrating to answer because you would write these calculate functions, but because, you know, all of a sudden, but you know, they didn't tell you all the information and, oh, I have a single table data model. Oh, well, calculate's not going to really work in that case. It really wants a star schema. And instead of trying to, you know, and you could, you know, somebody that's new and coming from Excel, trying to teach them about star schemas and then how calculate places filter context, you get into all these conversations and you really raise the bar as far as what they have to know in order to succeed. Um, so I came up with like, you know, what's now called the no calculate approach. It's like, okay, well, this works, whether it's a single table data model or if it's a star schema, if it's a snowflake schema, this is all referencing stuff that's in the fact table. So therefore it's going to work. All you need is a fact table. Um, and so really it came out of just sheer frustration with calculate a lot of times. Um, you know, I just, okay, I'll just avoid calculate. It just solves a bunch of, you know, I don't have to explain all this other stuff to somebody that literally has an Excel spreadsheet. They're used to Excel. They have a single table in their data model and they just want the answer. Um, it's really where it kind of grew out of, but then it, it sort of became my pattern for the pattern is right. You know, create some bars, create a table bar, use an X aggregator, solve. You can solve hundreds of problems like that. In fact, my sure. the DAX cookbook that I wrote, um, it doesn't use calculate in, in almost any of those. I I think I, I talk about calculate, but then I don't go and use it in any of the formulas. It's all written as pretty much bar, table bar, X aggregator, you know, every single one of those formulas. So um, and it, you know, it solves all kinds of problems. Uh, you can solve new customer problems, turning customers, all that stuff, running totals <laughs> and it just works. <laughs> And it's easier for people, it's an easier introduction to DAX, in my opinion, than, than anything else that's out there. And that's kind of also why I started DAX for Humans, my other uh, YouTube channel, other than Microsoft Hates Greg, was really just to teach DAX the way I think DAX should be taught. You know, you can learn about Calculate, but that shouldn't be the first thing you're, used, you're learning about DAX, in my opinion. And I have a weird opinion for things. <laughs> <laughs> was the frustration coming out of your own experience of not being able to solve the problems or were there those just maybe people asking questions and you were not able to give a very convincing answer as to why does this work with calculate so what what was it for you yeah i mean i taking the no calculate approach i definitely struggled with calculate when i first started uh writing dax right i mean i didn't understand mm -hmm. all of the nuances and and every, what was going on internally necessarily um it took me it took me a while to figure all of that out um, and it was a steep learning curve. You know, I would get, I would try these calculate things. I get back these weird results, you know, or I get back blank values or something. I just didn't understand why. Um, and you know, mm -hmm. but then when I, you know, if I use the other approach, it, it just, it just worked. <laughs> and so I figured if it was easier for me, it had to be easy. You know, if that was an easier learning path for me, then it has to be an easier learning path for other people out there. 
Um, so, and not everybody's on board with the no calculate approach, by the way. <laughs> There's a lot of detectors <laughs> out there, and I and I understand it, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think you wrote an article, an article on the community, or was that on your blog, uh, talking about the no calculate approach, and the way that you described is that it's you just want a table, and then if I could just make a table at the even at the aggregator level, then I could just iterate through the rows of the table, use the add columns functions to add the columns of the custom calculations that I want and just sum it up. And I really liked it. I mean, the way that you were thinking about DAX was that, hey, I'm just going to make the tables that I need add the columns that I would want. And it just makes a lot of visual sense for the learner to take a look at that. I mean, even if you were to put that table as a, as a physical table in Power BI, you would really see the aggregated result uh, or maybe in DAX Studio or things like that. So it just brings the user closer to the visual reality that calculate is like obscures it maybe and i agree with you i calculate is a very obscure function um in terms of you know you, and you there's no way to debug it right i mean if you take like the no calculate approach in that i think it, it's very similar to power query right what does power query do it returns a table for every step right and you can inspect that table and see what it's doing and if where things are messed up and it's the way people think in terms of sql as well a lot of people, you know, that's how they think about it. You know, you're really every join and everything else. It's just returning a table, right? And if I want, if I want to look at what's going on, I can, I can, okay, return that table and see what's going on. And so, I just think it makes a lot more when you have calculate. You almost have to write from the inside out, and I don't think that's natural for most people to write code that way. I think most people they write it, you know, in a top-down kind of linear fashion. Um, and now, mm-hmm. especially with two C, the two CSV function. It's even easier to debug DAX if you write it that way. It's now it's a breeze. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I mean you can literally extract the the CSV off the table and then you can just take a look at it, what's going on. Yeah, we so used to have to do things with concatenate X and everything else. Um, yeah, yeah. I know. And, you know, again, really I, mean, I th- in calculate. I think you have to understand that calculate existed before VARs existed in DAX. Like VARs yeah. have not always existed in DAX. You know, they were added later. Um, and so oh, once yeah, VARs were added, and I, I'll be forever grateful to, um, I can't remember, I'm totally drawing a blank on his name, but he taught me about VARs. Um, and and uh, I'll be forever grateful because once I learned VARs, man, I was off to the races with DAX at that point. It, like, it made a lot more sense to me, and I could do a lot, a lot of things, and I could actually debug it uh, versus having like 20 nested functions, and who knows where the, where the problem yeah. is. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, what's your opinion upon about the time intelligence functions that being used with the calculate function? Can you still you're just, uh, do that? Yeah, you're just poking the bear, aren't you? You're just trying to be <laughs> trying to be provocative on this. I I despise yeah. the time intelligence functions. I literally hate the time intelligence functions. I'm way more than I than I hate calculate. Like I, I calculate's fine. You know, I can find uses for it. You know, and it's useful sometimes. Uh, but I just have no use for the time intelligence functions. They are the most useless functions in DAX, in my opinion. And they're just uh-huh. terrible functions. They're not, they're poorly conceived. You know, the problem with them is, is that one, they're they're date intelligence functions. And two, <laughs> they're not time. And two, <laughs> they're not very smart. And you can't even use them with f- fiscal years. I mean, and what's killing, what yeah, killed me about right. that is Microsoft runs a fiscal year from, from, from July to June. You know, they internally have a fiscal calendar. And you can't use those functions other than like maybe total YTD is the only one that has an extra parameter to handle like fiscal years. Um, maybe a few more, but yeah. yeah there might be like some that. other ones, but it, yeah, it's just, it made no, it never made any sense to me. It's like, why would I learn how to write these um, in t- date intelligence functions that this way, if, if it's a calendar, a standard calendar, but then I have to use a completely different method to r- write time intelligence functions or date intelligence functions if I'm using a fiscal calendar. I just want one method that works for both. I mean, that that to me, again, goes back to, I mean, maybe it's because I efficiency and mechanical engineering was actually what I graduated in or something. I don't know. But it's like, I just want one way to do it. <laughs> like, I don't want to learn 12 different things, 12 different ways of doing something when I could just learn one pattern or one way of doing it. And it works. It always works. So. I don't know. And that's, you know, Brett Powell and I, and it was interesting because when I took over uh, writing the second editions for Brett Powell's books, Brett Powell, he and I saw completely eye to eye on this topic, you know, because in his original first editions, he's like, he made the same arguments that I did. It's like, well, these don't work for fiscal. So just learn this way of doing it. And then you'll be good, whether it's fiscal or standard calendar dates. 
So what are the most common patterns of mistakes that you've seen people making on the community when, you know, approaching their Power BI development, especially DAX and modeling? I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you the number one thing that I see is people just randomly throw and calculate into a wrapping their calculation and calculate for just no good reason. They don't even put a filter clause around it sometimes. But I, I think it's indicative of how and unfortunate because that how uh, pervasive calculate is in the in people in the DAX community as far as thought. You know, it's the, it's the most That's important right. function in DAX. It's this, it's that. And, you know, people read that stuff and they think they need to use calculate everywhere. Um, when 90% of the time, that there's no reason to use a calculate at all, an explicit calculate, I should say. Um, I believe you're referencing to just maybe uh, blanket wrapping the calculator around a measure. That's it. Like calculate and the measure name. That's it. Oh, yeah. I've seen that. Or, they're, or yeah. you know, or they're, they'll do a calculate sum, you know, and then some column. It's like, well, you don't just sum the column, man. <laughs> you don't, you don't need to calculate sum the column. <laughs> it's like, you're going to get yourself in trouble. It's, it's calculate. It's going to do something weird one of these times. And then, you know, then you're going to be not going to understand why you're getting a weird result back. When did you uh, started to see a problem with measure totals? Was that during your tenure with the community or, you know, with your own work? Like, when did you come across this realization that, hey, this table doesn't total up right? Oh, yeah. I first encountered that on my own, in my own stuff that I was doing. And then it just comes, I mean, it comes up literally almost daily on the forums. Um, that somebody, some sometimes I've answered five questions about measure totals on the forums in just one day you know people were like hey my subtotal's wrong hey my total's wrong back when i was an mvp you know i wrote that article in terms of measure totals you know and i was i was like i tacitly endorsed the way that measure totals work but i never felt that way i always felt it was the dumbest thing ever by default that they didn't just sum the rows like in excel and click and tableau and every other business intelligence tool that's ever been written. So the crazy part is it works with stack visuals, right? Stack visuals, they sum up the legend, essentially, um, yeah, just like as right. if it's rows mm -hmm. in a table. I, I don't know why table and matrix visuals were coded the way they were, um, but they're the only visuals in DAX or in Power BI that act that way. You know, every other thing, all the stack visuals, I think the waterfall chart, all of those, they act correctly, in my opinion. Again, these are all my opinions. <laughs> So do you think maybe it's like a technically challenging job to do it in a table or a matrix visual that's it's been taken so long and still not fixed? No, because I wrote I wrote I, I took a day and I wrote it in Deneb and it worked. Right. I fixed I fixed measure totals using Deneb. Um, there's third party visuals out there that that do it. Um, so I don't know. I don't know why it's not been a focus for Microsoft. It's the number one. It's probably one of the most barriers to entry, I think, for for use and adoption of Power BI that I've seen out there. Because you know, I've seen, I've I've talked to people, and, and they're like, yeah, I'm, I don't use Power BI. I could, I, I did this, 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 and I and my my totals were wrong in my table. And it's a piece of garbage code. I'm like, it's not garbage code, and <laughs> it's not garbage software. But I get your point, you know. But I've had, I've talked to people that have abandoned Power BI for that very reason. They're like, if I can't get a, if I can't get the total to come out right, if I have to write code to get my total to, to work, then it's that's not a good piece of software. I don't feel that way necessarily, but I've talked to people that do. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you start posting memes about it? Like, which I mean, it's like I don't know, five thousand days or so. <laughs> I haven't, I'm sure you I haven't have been count. doing memes for five thousand days. I think I lost it one day. I think I answered like five wrong measure total, you know, in the forums one day. And I was just like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done being nice about this topic. You know, I'm just going to start. I'm going to post. And it didn't start out as I'm going to do it every day. I just posted like one and it got in the views on that, that uh, LinkedIn post just blew up. I mean, it was like 30,000 views on that thing, which is that's nobody ever like reads my stuff. You know, 30,000 people out there they don't read my stuff. Um, I, I write weird stuff. So, but I, I mean, the views around that just like it blew up, you know, and there were so, so many comments around it and stuff. So I was like, I don't know. Well, let's just, let's just start doing it every day and, until it's fixed. <laughs> it's, <laughs> when did you, what, what day was it when you started? Like how many years ago did you it start? Was, oh, it was back, it was it back in year? October last year. It was back in October last year is when I started it. I'd have, I'd have to go to my LinkedIn and find the very first post, but I think it's the one where the guy throws the dude out of the boardroom you know, <laughs> and then basically the, the meme was like, hey, what, how, how should we do totals and in, in blah, blah, blah. And then, and then, you know, the last guy, he's just like, oh, totals in Excel have always summed the rows, you know, why, why, why change it now? And you know, he gets thrown out, of the, thrown out the window. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it, I understand this is a big problem because yesterday I was working on a model with somebody and I said that, hey, your, your totals are incorrect because when you're writing DAX, you're taking a look at a number in a certain filter context for a certain month and you're trying to get that very number right. So by the virtue of it, once you've gotten that number right, you don't tend to realize that, hey, there, every single cell is going to be a special calculation, can be modified, can be you know made into a new calculation altogether. So you not only have to work around that context, but also make sure that your totals are fitting in right. It's the very numbers that you're seeing on the screen are also the numbers that are being total in the end. So my question to you is that till the time Microsoft fixes the, the total problem, do you have any suggestions for people to be aware about such things coming into the play so that they have to be worried about the totals not matching up or at least be careful about it? Well, I mean, th that's part of the problem. I, I would actually lose sleep at night sometimes wondering about how many people out there have measure totals that are wrong and have no idea that, you know, no idea because who checks a total, right? It, of course, it's yeah. going to be the sum of the rows. That's how it's worked forever, right? And now it's, and now suddenly That's it's not. And I used to, you know, like, because it's very easy. Like you get your measure, right? Okay, you're looking at your rows and yeah, it's all right. Well, you're not even looking at the total because it's never been a problem before, right? And, and so I used to, and that's part of the meme campaign is to build awareness of it. Make sure people are aware that your totals aren't going to be right, you know, in a lot of cases uh, when you have these semi-additive measures and that. But I really don't have much much advice because there is no solution to the problem. Measure totals, the way they work today, absolutely and utterly destroy self-service BI, in my opinion. Because like you said, you know, to get the measure total to be right, you have to you have to write that measure based upon what is in that visual. Well, if you have a self-service visualization model where the users can put anything they want to in a table visual or a matrix visual, it is impossible. It is, and I've actually proved this on my channel. I've gone through and you can't even write enough code and stuff it into a DAX measure <laughs> that you could to account for all the situations. Um, so it's literally impossible to solve self-service. So in my opinion, again, going back to the adoption issue with Power BI, you basically measure totals that one issue basically makes self-service visualization a complete and another lie um, in Power BI, in my opinion. So I mean, interesting to talk about such such things, contrary to when everybody is just like going can go about uh, Power BI and stuff. Like, what are the real challenges that people are facing on the ground? Although the adoption is, you know, kind of picking up for Power BI, but still you are struggling from these real problems on the on the ground, you know, totals not adding up. And it seems trivial that you could just go on the community and fix it. But when, when the report goes to production and you are actually sitting, taking decisions based on that and the totals is not matching, it's very, very frustrating to take a look at that. I, I totally get it. Yeah, and, and the, the issue is I yeah. see a lot more people heading down this, the, at least the self-service visualization route, um, even large enterprises. They want, they want their, their BI teams to be focused on creating the data model, the data sets and the measures and the KPIs and all of that. But they want their users to create their own reports more or less, or do their own reports because the business users are the ones that know their business. They know what reports they want. They don't want to burden. They don't want to go back to the bad old days where the business requests a report, the BI team creates that report six months later. And then, you know, then there's like 72 different versions of that report that are just slightly different. Um, and then, you know, ends up five years down the ro road, you have, you know, 6 million reports and only three of them are actually used by the business, right? I mean, it's, I mean, nobody wants to go back to that. <laughs> so, what's your what's your take on power query um have you worked extensively with that yeah i'm not as good as power query as a lot of people out there like uh brian julius and some of those other folks out there you know, bi gorilla you know all that um there's a lot of people that are, are better at power query than i am um but i really like power query i really like uh where i think that has been very well engineered and it's been it's showing it shows up everywhere now in, in the microsoft ecosystem Right. I mean, it shows up in the Dataverse. You know, it shows up, you know, we can do data flows in Power BI. That's and right. so I think it's I think it's a great technology and, and, you know, big fan. So if you had to suggest uh, somebody trying to learn Power BI, especially the the desktop, you know, that's where everything starts, report building and stuff. What would you recommend that person? How should you kind of start your journey with Power BI as a tool? Because most people suck in visualizations because you ask the end user, Typically, uh, a manager, a senior manager, a vice president would take a look at the visuals and they kind of boil down the fact that, hey, Power BI is just a bunch of visuals. And there's a lot going behind that. Like you get the data, clean the data and all of all of that. So if I were to ask you, what would you recommend people who are starting off their journey with Power BI? So you're talking about like a business user or more of a data analyst or what, what kind of role? Somebody who would want to build reports like. 
developer. Maybe. Okay. I mean, everybody has their own way of learning. Like, for example, it's, what's kind of interesting is that, like, you know, I write books on Power BI, but I don't typically use books to, to learn a new technology. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't. Um, I'm more of a person that just, I'm going to pick up the tool and I'm going to do some research, you know, do a couple Google searches online and I'm going to figure it out. Right. I'm just going to start clicking buttons and seeing what I can do. That's how I learn. Um, that's how I've always learned. But not everybody learns that way. You know, so, you know, other people, there's lots of great books out there. Learn Power BI is, is you know, I think is a good one. I wrote it from the perspective of take somebody that's never, never used Power BI before and basically step them through a single scenario from loading up the data, transforming the data, you know, going through and building reports and, and template for the reports or the report page and basically walking the, you know, somebody through a single scenario on, and that way I thought was a good journey to allow people to learn Power BI. At least the basics touch on a bunch of different subject matter. But that's, you know, there's other really good books out there on uh, like Beginning Power BI, I think by Phil Seamark. I learned a ton from um from that, from that I, yeah, that's a book yeah, gold, like gold standard. So a lot of really, really sophisticated stuff, like they use the generate. That's, function. That is exactly, I learned yeah, generate from, from Phil, man. And, and that allowed me to solve like one of my first problems I ever had. I couldn't solve it. It was, it was around open, it was around open tickets for a help desk system. And that became the open tickets, uh, quick measure gallery entry. And I couldn't solve that problem for, for like months. And then I picked up, you know, Phil's book. And he, I, I, I looked at generate and generate and, and it was like, it all came together. It's like, oh, this is how I can solve this. And, and, and so, yeah, same it's, thing. I was kind of stuck with the many to many relationship, which I didn't really want to build between the two tables. And, you know, they were, those were two fact tables. And then I'm, I was trying to work with a very limited filter context. And then I had to apply filters between the two tables. And there was no other way that I could find unless I could build a relationship. And then same thing, like you said, I'm, you know, kind of produced over the book for a few days and then just clicked to me. Oh, I could use generate to solve this problem. Oh, this was, this was amazing. You yeah. So yes, I, I totally. Yeah. The agree. other one is uh, out on the community. There's a, there's a help page, right? And it, it has like really good, I mean, if you don't need to pay for a book or anything, you can go through the online, you know, help documentation, you know, they've got decent resources that it's kind of like your DAX and it's kind of like similar to like DAX and a, or dashboard in a day kind of training. You know, that's the, you know, I think the online resources are really good. And then again, you know, another way to do it would be to have somebody come in and go through the dashboard in a day training with you. I've delivered that that training dozens of times to ver various different companies. And a lot of times I'll customize it to be, use their data versus like the default data and that sort of thing. But I think that training is really good. I don't know if they've, I haven't delivered it in a while, so I don't know if they've kept up on it, but I assume they have. How much do you stress on the modeling part of it? Like, how do you structure the models and stuff? Would you stress on still going ahead with star schema, uh, even though you know you could literally solve all of that through iterators and some X and things? Oh like yeah, that? I still I still focus on star schema, especially in training and that sort of thing. Just because it really is it's really a powerful data modeling technique. So it's a good place to start. Now in reality, have I ever seen a real pristine star schema? Like almost never. Right? I mean, almost never. It's like you get into like some things like home building and some of these other, uh, you know, sophisticated, uh, you know, where they have really sophisticated data, um, really complex data. You know, star schemas are great for theoretical and for learning about how things work. Um, but in the real world, I know people talk about the real world. Um, I very rarely see a pristine star schema, you know, with any of the customers I've worked with. Always more complex than that. They always have, you know. Maybe like a... The easiest example that you can give right now where a star schema would be very difficult to create, of what industry would that be? What data would that look like? I mean, if you could just maybe speak over for a well, minute or so, if something comes well, to so I've mind. So I've done a lot of volunteer work for uh, um, a church, a, a particular church in the area that, that I have. And even their data, it's really difficult to model it via a star schema because they're, you're basically tracking like, okay, you have groups, you know, they have different uh, groups like that they, and then you have individuals, right? So you have individuals that are attending church and then those individuals are also attending, you know, these, these groups, you know, activities that are part of the church and everything. And it gets really complex really quickly. Um, it's hard for me to like really describe it to you in terms of like, you wouldn't believe how uh, much, sure. I've, how much sure. time and effort that I've spent with that church in terms of trying to get all of that data, you know, and it just does not fit into a star schema. Um, it does not. Sure. Um, Sure. 
I mean, any, at any particular time when you don't really have a categorize, he's summarizing the subcategory and the subcategory being further divided into main, you know, single granular transactions or something. And you have like crisscross flow of transactions, part of categories, categories, part of transactions and things like that. You know, I believe that's where it's going to be really hard to make a star schema. Would it be possible to simplify it? Yes, except that we would basically blow out the fact table to be like a billion rows. You know, <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay, okay, that's a solution, but it's not not a good solution because now, you know, they're going to be paying for Power BI Premium or even if you could even fit it into the, anyway. So there's, there's Star Schema is a good place to start. I, I still promote Star Schema and, and that sort of thing. It's a good learning vehicle, but it always becomes more complex than, than a Star Schema will allow you to do. Unless you're just really focused on, you know, you're trying to solve a single department, a single problem, you know, and that sort of thing. You know, I've seen Star Schemas be okay there. But very really limited focused in terms of you, you can still get a star schema, you know, a pristine star schema. Have you ever come across, I'm sure you would have, but I'm just asking, have you ever come across problems that still go beyond the no calculator approach and you would have to use a calculator for that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it happens from time to time. Although, in fact, there was a no calculate challenge that Alex Olson, Alex Olson, I can't remember. Um, he posted a no calculate challenge and I was like, I was ready to be like, basically it was a problem around inactive relationship, right? Because with calculate, you can use use relationship. And so it actually, you know, I was like, eh, I gave it a few attempts, you know, and I couldn't get anything as performant as what Olson had on, as, you know, using calculate use relationship. But then like Tamara June and, uh, and Sharma came along and, and like solved the problem. Um, and I've actually been using their approach and really it, bo it boils down to you're kind of using calculate in a sneaky way, <laughs> to be honest. You're using summarize, and by using summarize, it actually has a, an, an implicit calculate in there. Um, and so you can do some things, and it's a super fast. Um, in fact, my one of my latest videos, I was doing a, like year-to-date, quarter-to-date, month-to-date, week-to-date calculations. And I was using, here's the standard calculate way of doing it. Here's using total YTD or total QTD. And then I was using this new approach by using summarize and this stuff. And the summarize like blows the the no calculate summarize approach blows the doors off of total YTD and, and yes by like I, seven I, to I, times I remember seeing yeah that by video. like seven to ten times yeah. faster which has always been the complaint with people about the no calculate oh it won't scale you know it's not it's gonna be slow because you're not using calculate and calculate so fast and powerful it's like false <laughs> so uh, one interesting question that I kind of comes to my mind is that is there a way that Empirically, I mean, of course, you can do that using your, um, uh, you know, testing the queries and stuff like that, and how many milliseconds did it take to run. But is there a way that empirically you think about building the solution in a no calculate way where you almost believe that this is going to work or this is going to scale in terms of speed? Yeah. So I always, so the way I work, I operate is because the most important thing is to get something that works first. You can always optimize it later. <laughs> sure. Um, so sense. I always start with like, you know, yeah. like no calculate, a no calculate approach, you know. If it works fine, I get decent performance and that sort of stuff, then okay, I'm done. If there's performance issues and stuff like that, then I'll definitely look at using Calculate to optimize if possible and go down that route. I always want to get something that works first and then, you know, optimize it later. Um, and that's just how I approach it. Do you have a way to kind of formulate it? Meaning, okay, this measure is not working. Let me get rid of this part and then try another way. And then how do you find the another way? I mean, you just kind of tinker it or you have a way to kind of think of another way of approaching it that's a good question i just kind of wing it you pick up you pick up different techniques over the years and things like that and so i uh, you know and all these things are in the back of my head all these techniques i've learned they're like the tamar junes and that summarize approach to doing some of that stuff that's definitely going to be from now on you know if i run into a performance issue you know, I'm going to I'm going to look down that path to, to try to optimize it. Unfortunately, I can't give you a formula for it. Um, it's really it's really so dependent on the data model <laughs> and what situation you're you're trying to achieve. A lot of it comes into when you're trying to find things that are into like a lot of the problems I've seen is like, uh, well, I did a whole blog series post about optimizing a DAX. So somebody came and had basically are having performance issues with these measures that this measure that they had written. I think I did like a four part blog article. I'd have to get, I have to send it to you, but that might help you in terms of like, so for example, like you go through and say, okay, try to adjust your filtering, how you're doing your filtering um, and make sure that the things that are going to filter out the most rows are, you know, are first in your filters and that sort of thing. What I do is I break the problem. So if I might have like 
filter, a one filter clause, and it has like, you know, maybe six different filters. Well, I'll start breaking that out and say, okay, I'll have, I'll have six filter clauses in six different variables. And I, you know, and see which one, if I eliminate this one, like, where's my performance problem? Like, which one of these filters is, is going to filter out the most rows? I'll make sure I get that in there first. That's one way. Mm-hmm. So I'd, I'd have to send you, like, I think those blog articles I wrote. I think that's going to um, be helpful. I might really have just been one blog article, but it'll show you my thinking because it steps through, like, how I went through and troubleshot and then got that measure down. I think I improved that measure by an order of magnitude or more. And that was a really interesting use case. And I'm not going to say I am the world's greatest DAX optimizer in the world because I'm not. But, you know, it at least, at least would give you an, an idea of like how I thought about how I thought through the process and, and what I did to fix that measure. And I think people actually took that blog article and actually even proved it even further. <laughs> Oh, interesting. I would love to take a look at it. And I'll also put the show notes in this uh, video and then people can take a look at it, including me. So that's interesting. It was a really interesting case study, in my opinion. So I actually wrote it up. Do you want to talk about your recent channel, uh, DAX for Humans, which is not using any of the controversial titles or anything? (laughs) (laughs) It's very, very friendly, DAX for Humans. (laughs) You mean like your DAX is garbage and things like that? (laughs) 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 <laughs> yes. So Dax for Humans is, is a completely 180 degree different channel than, than, you know, Microsoft hates Greg. Like my Microsoft hates Greg channel. I literally, I, I fire up my, uh, my recording software. And I just, I record it in one take. There's no editing. Sometimes it's two takes. If I forget to re- share my screen, I've done that. Um, but it's just, you know, I literally, I've got, I've got a topic. I might prepare a little bit as far as like what I want to present. I mean, then I just wing it, right? And I just fire up the, the, the camera and just go. There's almost never a script that I've written out for that video channel. So and so Dax for Humans is a, is a 180, right? Completely different. It's And, and, DAC, and Microsoft Hates Greg just covers everything. Like I, It's whatever I'm thinking about or want to do at the time. Dax for Humans is, is 100% different um, in terms of, so it's focused on one topic and one topic only. And it's basically take somebody if that doesn't know, that has never picked up Power BI before, and teach them DAX, right? In the way I think that the DAX should be taught. And each episode is like, is scripted out beforehand. It, each episode, you know, is only like two to five minutes pretty much. And it actually has production quality because I have my son actually as my video editor. And so he adds in all the title screens and uh, does all the editing and, and all that stuff. And, you know, I have to, le- I had to learn new software to do it. Cause I got like, he had, I had to have my son teach me about OBS and this and that and how to do all that. You know, which I didn't know. He's much better at that stuff than I am. So, and so he does all that. So it's just a completely and utterly different channel, and with no, hopefully, no controversy, other than people that people that like calculate. It's I'm Greg, not I have to it. ask you this thing. I, I have to. I have to ask this question. For all the videos that I have seen for uh, Dax for Humans, I've seen you wearing this robe. Uh, like a, a bathrobe or something and if you don't want to answer that's totally okay but then it just stood out and and i have to ask you why is that <laughs> <laughs> ah, so how much can i reveal uh let's see um so i mean the original idea okay, first, for the road has anybody asked uh, you that question on the comments somewhere or is it just me <laughs> no, no it's, it's been brought up <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's kind of a unique aspect of that channel <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, I so there are a couple reasons for the robe. One is I wanted all of the I wanted all the videos to be very consistent in terms of like the opening and all of that sort of thing. That's why you'll see like all the thumbnails are kind of consistent and whatever. And the easiest way to like because I, I you know clothes get dirty and things like that, right? I mean, so I just figured okay if I was just wearing one thing during for every every time the video, then it, it's going to have a very consistent look and feel to it. And the, the other idea that behind the robe was I wanted people to like, this isn't, is a different kind of, you want to be, you want to be comfortable here. You know, this is not, you know, I'm not trying to like teach you all this techie nerdy stuff and, you know, and, and, you know, highly technical stuff. I wanted people that are, they've never even touched this, this thing called DAX before. I wanted to give them a very comfortable kind of, <laughs> I don't know. There's another backstory to the, no one's figured out yet in terms of to the, to the robe, but I can't, I can't really reveal that. People are going to have to figure that out on their own. <laughs> When I was taking a look at the first video, and maybe it was a few months ago, I just appeared in my feed and I took a look at it. And obviously, obviously, I was familiar with your work. And I obviously I was taking a look at the screen. But in the moment, I took a look at you and you were in the robe. And I was wondering, maybe he's taken a bath and maybe he didn't have time. <laughs> so he just got into the robe and he started recording a video. But then the next one came up like that. And the next one came up like that. Then 
I thought I'm just going to have Greg on the show someday and I'm going to have this question put up. What's the story behind the role? But that's, I, I get what you're trying to say. It's like you're trying to make people comfortable and stuff like that. So yeah, interesting, interesting. <laughs> just, <laughs> I come up with weird ideas, Chandeep. I did, you know, I, I come up with weird ideas and I was run with them. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that was catchy. That was certainly catchy. Uh, <laughs> it, it seemed like you've just taken a bath and you didn't have really have the time to decide on what to wear on and you have this recording to do. So you just went on the robe for that moment. It also made me think for just a bit that maybe somebody had photoshopped that robe onto you and you were wearing clothes <laughs> underneath that. <laughs> <laughs> my, that would not, I would not put that past my son to do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was interesting. That was really catchy. Anyways, how would you uh, tell somebody to pick up, start learning DAX? Uh, you know, the approach to kind of getting more sophisticated in solving more dense problems. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, the, the really important part of DAX for humans is the, actually the part that's coming up, the most recent videos, which is they're all uh, titled Thinking in DAX. Um, and then, you know, the first one is you need to understand that DAX thinks in tables. You know, yes, there's scalers and things like that, but really DAX is all about tables. You know, every operation, like just like Excel thinks in terms of cells and ranges of cells, you know, DAX thinks in terms of tables. And that's really like the first one. And then you can filter those tables. I'm going to show like how you can select columns in the tables. So if you really want to get down to a cell, right, it's really a matter of filtering to a row and then selecting the right column, right? And you can still get down to a cell level. Um, if you need to, but you have to do it thinking in tables <laughs> and not not in cells. Um, I think that's one thing that people really struggle with, if, you know, coming from Excel, is that different, you know, concept in terms of how the languages, the formula language, think about things. We've done your X aggregator, right? It's that pattern that I'm teaching, mm. um, and it's going to be kind of the cornerstone of DAX for Humans. Yeah, that's right. Any books that you're working on at the moment? Any new books or something? So I so I'm trying to so I'm working on so you know how there's the, the definitive guide to DAX, right? So Brian Julius has been pushing me for a while to write the definitive guide to Power Query. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm pitching this. I'm actually we're, we're, I'm working on the outline. I've got a draft of the outline. I'm working with a number of uh, Power Query experts that are out there, and so it's going to be a collaborative effort, hopefully, for Pact, and we'll, we'll you know hopefully write the definitive guide to Power Query, and it's going to include a lot of uh, like it's going to include Brian Julius and and a lot of you know usual suspects in in the uh, Power Query community. Right. And I'll try to get it so that, you know, each author is only writing maybe, you know, three chapters or something like that because, you know, everybody's busy. <laughs> so Brian has another idea for a book that we might collaborate on. But yeah, I'm always looking out there, looking for new ideas for books and that sort of stuff because I hate my life. And, you know, I want to I want to spend my weekends writing books instead of like, you know, being outside. So <laughs> <laughs> do you do you ever get uh, like picked up by people at Microsoft for being outgoing in terms of your opinions on on Power BI and DAX and other things. I mean, you're quite vocal about them and I like it. Well, well, who, well, who knows, right? I mean, so I, I mean, I was just removed from the MVP community, right? For a, uh, a code of conduct violation uh, is what they called it. I, I have, you know, they haven't told me what it is. It really doesn't matter. I mean, the code of conduct really means they, if they want to remove you, they can just say, oh, you did a code of conduct violation and remove you from the program which is, it's kind of jacked up because of some of the stuff in that code of conduct is really heinous stuff, like, you know, like bestiality and incest and everything else, where it's like, oh, great, so Microsoft just tacitly and said that I was a child pornographer. Great, you know, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so I'm pretty sure that was not the read my code of conduct violation, but who knows, because they won't tell me. I think it's because I made the skull bong joke, and that's, you know, that's probably the reason why, because that was the latest video that came out. But it's happened before, right, that he wrote an article on size and performance and how it impacts, you know, DAX and things like that. And of course, a lot of double entendre capability, which I was explicitly clear to point out that when I was talking about performance, I'm talking about DAX performance, not any other performance, mm -hmm. you know, and I was talking about the size of the data model, not the size of anything else. Um, but I like to joke around a lot. So I was going to get in trouble eventually. That's why, you know, like when people are like, oh, Greg, that's awful. I'm like, no, dude, it was going to happen, man. It's just me. You know, I'm just, I am who I am. And I'm going to, I'm going to joke about stuff. And eventually it's going to get me in trouble, right? It's not like it doesn't happen in my personal life as well. You know, it just happens the way it goes. And so I'm used to it. I'm like, I'm over 50 now. So it's not like I'm going to change either. So <laughs> you, you would also have taken off uh, from LinkedIn for a bit, I guess, uh, for the measure of total things or something or the other. Who knows? LinkedIn is weird like that, man. There's a lot of times where like, and it probably was over the memes, 
so LinkedIn has a lot of, and a lot of these social media platforms have these, you know, basically it's AI and it's watching what you're doing. And if it, if it sees unusual activity, right? It's the anomaly detection um, of your machine learning algorithms. It's those uh, algorithms. And so, yeah, if I have a post and most of my posts, get a few hundred views, and then all of a sudden I start regularly posting memes that are getting tens of thousands of views, that's going to show up as an anomaly, <laughs> right? And then, you know, they're going to do some kind of verification and stuff, but it's none of those platforms. LinkedIn is terrible that way. Like, uh, like it's happened to a lot of content creators on LinkedIn, expect, particularly that all of a sudden they, they start posting really good content and then their views like shoot up and all of a sudden they're banned. So it's all that anomaly detection stuff. And it's just, they're trying to prevent bots and all of that other type of stuff, but boy, do they suck at that technology. <laughs> in my opinion, because the number of content creators that have gotten banned from LinkedIn is just, it, you know, it's just crazy. If you really start, I mean, talk to Brian Julius about that stuff. It's insane. Yeah. You know, how many of his friends and things like that have gotten banned off of, and it, it's in the communication is terrible. Because it's like you've been, you know, I mean, literally the communication is you've been permanently banned. Um, obviously, it wasn't permanent because I'm back on with my original <laughs> account. Thank you, Kelly K, and for helping me out with that. But I mean, it's like, I don't know. It's just, it's god awful how they treat their content creators, which, I mean, that's a large part. That's the reason you have a social media platform and that for as LinkedIn as anyway. That's right. And you're getting your advertising dollars and everything else is from the content creators. So stop banning them. Is you just, I don't know, it makes no sense to me, but most people don't care what I think, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, your content has been amazing, especially the uh, the work that you've done on the community. It's been very, very helpful for a lot of people, thousands of people, of course. And when I was starting out, I read a lot of your answers, uh, and that were very instrumental in building up my understanding. So yeah, excellent work, Greg. And it was lovely to kind of have you here. And I never really thought that I would get a chance to kind of meet you when I when I started off my journey with Bar VI. But thanks for accepting the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why and that's why I do. I don't do what I do because people give me awards or anything like that. I could care less about any of that stuff. I mean, I really believe in the Power BI product. You know, primarily it's helped me. I do a lot with it. You know, it runs my practice to a large degree. And I just like helping other people. And that's why I do it. I do it that, you know, it grows the community and we can all learn from each other. I've learned from a ton of people, you know, and I like giving back to the community. And that's why I do it because it, it, it helps. You know, I've been told that a number of times. It's like, oh, Greg, you know, your stuff, the last first started out, your stuff was awesome. It really helped me out. I'm like, that's awesome. I love to hear that. That's why I do it. Interesting. Um, so thank you. Great. Great. One last question. Do you have any like tips, let's just say five tips or four tips for the adoption of Power BI to really shoot up? Like what would you suggest changes should be made in the application so that adoption shoots up drastically? Measure totals, of course, is coming up in the list. Measure totals, <laughs> of course, measure totals, right? Um, uh, you know, it's interesting in terms of they're trying to make some changes around the interface right now. We'll have to see how those all play out. There's a lot of things in the UI um, I think a lot of people find confusing and different than other Office applications. And they've, they've made some changes over that over the years with the improvements to the ribbon and things like that to make it more like feel like Word or Excel. Um, they're, trying to to replicate, they're trying to replicate PowerPoint mm -hmm. experience. Um, that's what they're trying to do, I believe. Yeah. Oh, you know, I'd have to think about that one, Jan Deep. <laughs> there's, there's a ton of things they could do to, to improve it um, in terms of, uh, and I'd have to put together, I'd have to compile a list of, of all those things. I mean, the problem with Power BI is there's so much to it compared to, it's not like Word. You know, Word has some of the complex elements in terms of like, if you try to do mail merge and things like that, or I mean, but you don't have a complete, I mean, really Power BI is two applications, right? It's Power Query Editor and it's, you know, that has its own interface and, that's and right. all of that to it. That's different than Power BI Desktop. Um, it's a tough problem to solve. I don't envy Microsoft in that in that department one one bit. Um, that is a tough problem because you have your data model, you have your relationships, you have your, you know, then you have the visualization pane and, and then you have, then you have Power Query Editor where you're doing all your, you know, query transformations and stuff. I mean, it's a, I understand why people struggle with it, but I'm not sure I'm the best person to, to talk to in terms of how to improve adoption other than, hey, when a user gets a, has a total in a table visual, it ought to sum the rows by default, you know, or at least give them the option to. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, when you think... I'd have to really think through how they could make, because you really, I mean, when Power BI first started, right, that formatting pane, the visualizations pane was a lot simpler, right? Exactly. And you didn't have very many options right. <laughs> over there, That's which right. was good in a way, but it's, you know, but then of course you couldn't do a lot of stuff. And now, I mean, holy smokes, man, you get one visualization, it's got like, 
like 20, 30 different format cards. And yeah, sometimes I mean, there's two, there's two different types of borders and two different types of borders and outlines and shades and whatnot. I completely agree. Yeah, and it's not even consistent a lot of times between visuals. Um, so they should clean that up. But I think there's a lot of changes coming down the pipe with around visualizations. I've, you know, Miguel Myers and things like that um, has been showing, you know, doing kind of road shows with some of the new visualization stuff. And you know, they've got the preview stuff where they're doing a whole different interface for it. That's a pro tough problem to solve because on the one hand, everybody says it's confusing and hard to learn. But on the other hand, they want all those options. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I agree. so I don't know. I agree. All right, uh, Greg, I think we've been up past the sacrosanct one hour mark. Uh, I don't really want to take a lot of your time. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll text you or maybe email you another time. Maybe we can meet up. Yeah, Chindi, had a great time, man. <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> I'll come prepared, more prepared next time with uh, UI changes and things, <laughs> that need, things that need to be improved. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Thanks, Greg. All right, man. Have a good one. Bye-bye.